Let's talk about close combat. This is when two enemy formations uh, come into contact and fight, as it were, hand to hand. Uh, the first thing to say is that the, the close combat rules only apply to attacking formations which are infantry or cavalry. Um, armoured fighting vehicles have a different form of, of close combat which is called overrun. I'll talk about that in a different video and, and it, slightly different circumstances apply. But uh, close combat is how a, an infantry or, or a cavalry unit um, comes into in contact and fights directly with another an enemy formation. Uh, the first thing that has to happen is that the formations have to move into contact. Um, now, close combat occurs whenever two enemy formations are touching at all, uh, even corner to corner, uh, and clearly that means that one of them has to move into contact with the other. Now, like all other movement, this takes place during the movement phase, uh, which happens uh, before the fire phase and, and then before the close combat phase itself. So uh, one of the consequences of that is that the, uh, the moving units, the uh, attacking units, can't fire before it moves. Um, the, uh, the enemy unit, if it's in position to do so, can fire during the, the movement phase as, as opportunity fire. And that is also true of any other uh, units on the same side as the defender, uh, which can bring fire to bear on the attacking unit as it moves, as with all normal opportunity fire. So, uh, to be eligible to move into contact, uh, as I said, you need to be an infantry or cavalry unit. Uh, you also uh, need to be not suppressed, or worse, you mustn't be suppressed or fragmented. And the other um, restriction is that you cannot be in transit column. You can only uh, enter close combat if you are in the normal deployed formation, as with this one here. So, uh, before uh, you, can, you can move into contact, firstly, um, as with any move, you have to have a move available on the decision die for your formation group. So you roll the decision die as normal, and as one of your moves, you will attempt to move into contact. The first thing then you have to do, once you've determined that you can, you can see your target and that you are within movement range, is to take a morale test. Um, the uh, attacking unit has to, uh, to roll a morale test and... Um, clearly, if it if it fails and falls back, then the attack doesn't happen. Uh, if it takes disorder markers as a result of that, then it will take those disorder markers into the um, into the combat. And then, as I say, there'll uh, be opportunity fire potentially from the defending units. Um, it's possible that uh, if the attacker is coming in from a from a flank, let us say. Um, that the defending unit would not be in a position to fire because of the firing arc, uh, in which case there clearly wouldn't be opportunity fire. But if there is, then the attacking unit has to survive it um, and you know not be uh, disordered or, or panicked um, before it can make contact. The defender may have to take uh, a morale test. The attacker always does. The defender may have to in certain circumstances. If they're suppressed or fragmented, then they have to take a, a test. Um, if they are, uh, if their morale quality is recruit or lower, then they have to take a morale test. If they're unsupported, um, and by that the rules mean that there are no formed friendly units in eight inches within eight inches of the defender, so they are isolated. Uh, the other specific reason why you may have to take a morale test um, is if you are within eight inches of a routing unit on your own side. Uh, if any of those apply, then the defending unit has to take a morale test as well, and if it breaks and runs, then clearly the attacker can occupy the, the position, but there won't be a fight. Uh, assuming that all of those things uh, go through, that the morale tests on both sides are passed, then the attacking unit will move forward into contact, uh, and the actual mechanics of the close combat fight will take over. So, our units are now in contact and we have to actually fight the close combat. Now, as I've said earlier, um, even the slightest contact, um, even at corner to corner, will cause uh, units to fight. Um, if you have uh, more than a one-to-one, -one, you fight individual close combats between the units and, and if, for example, two-on-to-one, um, if one of the uh, attackers 
um, is driven off, the other one wins, then one will drop out of the fight and fall back, and the fight will continue until it, it reaches an end. All close combats are fought out over multiple rounds if necessary within the same game turn. Uh, there is no uh, concept of a close combat going on from turn to turn. So all close combats are fought to a conclusion. Now the uh, actual mechanism for uh, working out the result of the close combat is is quite tricky and also quite different from any of the other mechanisms in uh, Panzer Corps. Um, so it doesn't use uh, different size dice, for example. Uh, the basic idea is that you are you base the results, the outcome, almost exclusively on the quality, the morale quality of the the units fighting. Um, anything up from you know, from partisans or militia up to hardened and the f the first thing you do is use this table to determine uh, a combat letter um, and the combat letter will translate into a number of disorder points that you inflict on your opponents um, so each unit uh, takes the, so you take the units on the left uh, let's say we have a regular unit one of the uh, combatants um, and you read across the columns till you find the quality of the opponent. So let's suppose this regular unit is fighting a recruit. Um, you will be in column 6 uh, with a letter C. Similarly the recruit, uh, doing it the other way round, will read across and find themselves in column 4 uh, with a, a letter E. Uh, now to those results you then have to make some shifts um, and all of the shifts move left, in other words, make the um, attack less effective. So all of them are um, negatives to the to the attacker or the fighter. Um, and you can see those in the uh, central uh, table on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, all sorts of reasons why your close combat may become less effective if you're facing a tank unit. And that would be um, uh, including uh, an attachment, uh, similarly facing um, medium or heavy machine guns, a flamethrower. Um, if you're suppressed or fragmented, there's clearly a, a, a disbenefit. Um, if you're facing two or more units, this is where uh, a, a one formation fighting two will be at a disadvantage. In each of its combats, um, it, will, it will have that negative shift. Those three at the bottom for cover... Uh, it's not stated quite explicitly, but I certainly take that to mean that both sides in the combat will uh, take those negative shifts. Uh, we have to remember again that this is uh, two battalions effectively fighting each other in a large area of ground. Um, we're not looking at you know a, a squad running up to a fence and trying to f climb over it and fight another squad. Um, we're talking about probably an, quite an extended um, skirmish and, and period of fighting um, in an area rather than uh, at a line um, and these uh, modifiers I take to mean that both sides will be able to take advantage of cover within that ground uh, to reduce the, the, the casualties and therefore um, there are column shifts to the left. So at the end of all of that you wind up with each side in the combat has a letter which um, designates the uh, effectiveness of its of its combat, um, but that will not decide the results of the combat. Um, in in effect, the those letters and the disorder markers that they represent uh, are not relevant to who wins and loses the combat. Because the next thing you do, having worked out which columns each of the uh, the, the units are in. Um, you then have a, what they call a leadership role, um, and these are is a straight roll between the two sides. Uh, each rolls one d6 uh, and applies that fairly limited number of modifiers down there at the bottom on the right hand side. Um, there's a few nationality modifiers, um, and perhaps the most important one is the decorated leader. This is where decorated leaders really pay for their uh, their, their upkeep. Um, because on a d6 roll, one or, uh, plus one or two um, can really alter your chances of winning. Um, because the <coughs> the side that wins this this straight roll off um, wins the the combat, wins that round of the combat anyway. Um, it doesn't actually say in the rules, but I assume that if you get a tie, you simply roll again straight away until you get a clear winner or a loser. 
um, the, the rules certainly don't say what to do if there's a tie uh, and they assume that there is a winner and a loser. So now you have a winner and a loser and the side that won um, imposes a, a, another left shift another left uh, column shift on its opponent so in other words the side that lost moves left again if it can all of these shifts I should have said um, stop if you reach the, the left hand column you can go no further um, and so uh, uh, another left shift if, if, if it up, comes up has no effect so the winner first um, the winner never has to fall back the winner stays in place however many disorder markers it takes and, and as we've seen um, in theory, the winner could actually have taken many more disorder marks than the loser, uh, depending on the, the, the letters, if they happen to get a very good roll. Um, the loser, uh, it depends, that the, the, the uh, effect of the combat on the loser depends on the disorder markers. If the uh, winner scored twice as many, doubled the disorder markers that the loser scored, then the loser falls back. Um, they, they panic six six inches backwards or, or into cover if it's closer, but they certainly they, they break off the combat. Um, they they have a panic marker put on them, um, and they uh, they fall back uh, out of the combat, and that's the end of it. If the loser is not uh, doubled, then they immediately become suppressed, or if they're already suppressed, they become fragmented. Now again, the rules aren't quite explicit. In theory you could have um, a loser who did not have let's say three disorder markers um, but still has to become suppressed through this rule similarly they might be suppressed already and have to become fragmented without having six I take it that they uh, they take the suppression or fragmentation effect um, even if the disorder markers that they've got don't appear to justify that again this will be very rare because mostly if you lose a combat you will um, take a substantial number of disorder markers but in theory it's possible and that's how I've always run it. Uh, the loser then must pass a morale test, so they must take a morale test to stay in the fight. Um, if they fail then they fall back four inches or if there's any cover they can fall back eight inches into that cover and they will add disorder markers to um, what, whatever they've already got uh, based on the results of the morale test but they do not automatically panic um, uh, simply by failing that test. So if, if they fall back clearly that's uh, again the end of the combat. Um, if they don't then the combat continues and there are further rounds as I've said um, until a decision is reached. Now um, th as uh, combat goes along you will be accumulating disorder markers on both sides and it's actually very rare uh, for a combat even to last into a second round in my experience um, but in theory it can and you just keep going until uh, all sides if there's more than two until all units have broken off and the combat is at an end uh, there's one other little detail um, one of the ways you can completely lose a battalion um, in it is in close combat which I guess makes sense because the two sides are so intermingled if a, a side loses and, and has accumulated more than 15 disorder markers uh, then it then it's picked up it's gone um, it doesn't fall back it can't um, retreat and regroup or come back again the next day uh, presumably the uh, it, it's completely dispersed um, probably a lot of the uh, survivors are captured because they are uh, intersp intermingled, interspersed with the enemy. Um, but that is one of the ways that, uh, apart from surrender, uh, that you can completely lose a formation if it, if it loses very badly in close combat. So I hope that's clear. I will do some examples, but uh, as I say, it's, um, it's quite non-intuitive, particularly the way in which the the winner of the combat is determined by the leadership role um, and not by the number of disorder markers that each side inflicts. That's quite an important thing to, to, to understand because it's it's probably not normal um, for most uh, war games rule sets. Uh, the side that, that inflicts most casualties is almost always the winner in, in most rule sets where hand-to-hand where -hand combat is relevant. Uh, but that's not the case here. The, uh, again, the the philosophy of these rules is that it's much more about leadership. Um, you've got uh, two large groups of, of men fighting over a large area 
and the side that can uh, lead its troops better, organize them better, um, get them motivated better, is the one that will win, even if it happens to have taken more casualties. So, um, as I say, that's the uh, the close combat. Quite rare in my experience, much, much rarer than um, direct fire, uh, because in order to come to hand-to-hand -hand blows, um, you have to survive uh, a rush across perhaps open ground, um, and the, uh, the the defenders also have to stand to take the combat. So, uh, one way or another, they are fairly rare, but they are decisive, of course. Um, either you'll uh, push the defender back and take the ground, uh, and usually these are uh, these close combats happen uh, over a, an important objective or some key feature on the map, um, or you won't. You'll be repulsed probably with heavy casualties. So close combat, although as I say fairly rare, is often the climax of a battle.